how much we all love someone who appreciates not just what we do, but what it took for us to do it. Jill Hollenbeck was here all this week in the heat in the narthex with no air conditioning. And she was painting the wall that would be the backdrop for our uh, reception this morning. Um, and when I offered to get her a fan or open the doors, no, you can't do that when you paint. You just have to be hot and uncomfortable. A wall in our narthex that looked uh, pretty beat up. She turned it into a beautiful and lovely space again. As you all know, Annette, which just sung for us so beautifully, uh, has taken up the Herculean task of coordinating our church office off and putting in 40 plus hours a week uh, as a volunteer. Six of uh, Little White Chapel folk gathered this week with their red t-shirts on and flyered the neighborhood at 8 o'clock in the morning letting folks know Little White Chapel was here, alive and well, and waiting for them to walk through the door. And the list goes on and on, the board and the elders and the cards and preparing for Bible study every Sunday morning, laying in all that delicious food and preparing for communion, both services, the telephone calls and everything all of you do. What you do is wonderful because you thought about somebody else. And it is also wonderful because you took time away from your other pursuits to do it. Not just what you did, but what it cost you. I thank God for each and every one of you. The story that Matt read in our hearing today is the excitement of the disciples returning from their Jesus assignment. And Jesus saw what they had done. Look, Jesus, you told us to take only one tunic and lodge at this first house we came to, and you said our God power would be determined by their faith power. Look what we were able to accomplish by doing exactly what you said do. The people opened their hearts and their homes, and they received us. The disciples had done well, and Jesus saw that the disciples had done well, and he saw what it took for them to do well. Jesus knew that ministry can be joyous and jubilant. It can also be tedious and exhausting. Jesus could tell that his disciples were tired, and more than physically tired, they were spiritually spent. They needed to do what Jesus did after he spent time with people. They needed to withdraw to a place by themselves where they could encounter God again as the pilgrims that they were, as the pilgrims that we all are. But this text records that while they were on their way to take their rest, people recognized them and figured out where they were going in the boat and traveled there on foot and got there ahead of Jesus and the disciples. That's some faith. The text further states that when Jesus finally arrived and went ashore, he realized that a huge crowd had assembled from all of the nearby towns. And so without a second thought, he went to minister to them. But before he began to minister and interact with them, he showed to them the character trait that is clearly stated at least eight times in the Gospels, and also the character trait that is implicit in everything that Jesus did. He showed to the people the same character trait that he showed to the disciples when they returned from their mission. Jesus showed to them his compassion. Now, you know that compassion is not the same thing as pity. We can have pity for the Syrian refugees. We can have pity for those dying of the drought in Africa. We can have pity for those children who have, made, who have been made orphans at the Mexican border because authorities were so eager to separate their families in order to make a point that they have come up with no way to reunite them. As you know, some of these children may well be orphans forever. Pity can be visited on a situation, any situation that we see from afar. But compassion means that you are not far away. Compassion means rather that you are right here, suffering along with those who suffer because you have drawn so close to them that you see their situation through their eyes. The Germans call it Mitleid, compassion. I am with you in the passion of your sorrow. I see through your eyes. Our feelings become as one. 
I often see through your eyes what it costs you to show up, sacrifice, and volunteer for Christ's church. And because of that, I am moved by you. The text says that as Jesus drew near to these thousands of people, this group that he would very shortly feed with two fish and five loaves of bread, he had compassion for them. His heart broke as he saw that Rome had failed them and that their temple had failed them. Jesus saw they were sheep without a shepherd. Unlike what had happened to Jesus at Bethlehem, these people came with great faith. And Jesus' own teaching, your faith has made you well, meant that he was at his most potent, his most powerful. Because of their faith, he was able to fully be their shepherd. Now, there's something worth noting about Jesus' compassion. Jesus, to quote the book of Revelation, Jesus is the lamb seated on the throne of God who has been through much for the salvation of the world. And to quote the Gospel of John, Jesus is the Word of God that was with God from the beginning. So the compassion of Jesus is more than just the sympathy of a more fortunate friend or a distressed friend. The compassion of Jesus reveals the broken heart of God. The compassion of Jesus reveals God drawing near to suffer with me and to suffer with you. Jesus wanted us to know that God is not watching us from a distance as some songwriter wrote. God is here involved with us, moving with us, rejoicing and agonizing with us. So knowing that about God, knowing that about God's compassion, how do you think God feels as we continually find ways to overpower each other and dominate each other. Last night in the 5 o'clock Little White Chapel service, a woman lifted up this prayer request. I am trying to find legal representation for my 84-year-old neighbor. The owners of the building where she lives have found a way to evict her, and at the age of 84, they are setting her on the street, and she will be homeless. How do you think God feels about that? This week, I sat with a man who had raised his children along with his wife in their home, and now he has to sell the home in order to pay for his wife's cancer treatments because health care has said we are not willing to sustain your wife's life any further. And so he has no way to leave. How do you think God feels about that? Can't you imagine, even as we say we don't anthropomorphize God, don't you think God's as God weeps along with us. But you know what? You and I, most of us, are not like those Hebrew people rushing from their homes with their children and their parents and they're sick and they're dying trying to get to Jesus. No, most of us in here have lives that are ordered and we like it like that. We might plan, oh, I have a very serious surgery scheduled later in the year, but I'll schedule it when I return from vacation, but early enough in the fall so that I have time to heal for the holiday. I can do that because I'm in control. But as I mentioned these two people early, if you look closely, you will notice more and more around you, there are more people whose lives are not well managed. There are more and more people whose lives are not that manicured. Looking around us, looking into other eyes, we see people often eating meals with us in our home, sharing the Lord's Supper with us. People who are living, as Thoreau said, quiet lives of desperation. There are people looking at us who are hurting like those people were trying to get to Jesus, hurting in plain sight. Before hospitality, they need compassion. This week, clergy and lay people in our denomination had meetings and hearing sessions all around the region. 
asking people to talk about what they would look for in a new regional minister. For the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the regional ministers like a bishop, like a cardinal, we're going to get a new one. What do we want? And most of the lay people and the clergy said, we want someone who will get back to us quickly. Somebody who will answer our request. Somebody who will respond to us with compassion. Somebody who will let us know that we are here. We have moved past in most of our churches. Most of our disciple churches are about the size of Little White Chapel. And we have been open and we have been progressive and we have taken classes on racism and the LGBTIQ community and classes about the differently abled and classes about inter-religious uh, uh, exercise. But what are we going to do for the individual problems that exist in our church for which we have no clear, one, one, no cure? One man stood up and he said, I am not a black person, I am not a, uh, a Latino person, I'm not an Asian person. I am an Anglo person living right here in the San Fernando Valley, and I have three families in my church, all that have been uh, touched because somebody in the family is addicted to heroin. Who's going to help me? What help am I going to get from the regional office? Who's going to take my calls and look at me with compassion? My church is so small, he said, that at least three families go under, my church will close. He needs a regional minister who has compassion. When Jesus said to his disciples, let's get away so that you can rest from your labors, he was showing compassion to them. And on their way to rest, a greater need arose. Plans had to be changed. Agendas had to be readjusted. People were in trouble. They also needed hospitality, preceded by Jesus' compassion. 21 centuries have gone by. People are still hurting. People right before our eyes, right before Jesus' eyes are in distress. How do you think God feels when God watches a spouse who can do nothing for a hurting other spouse? Before the hospitality of God's kingdom can be offered, before right health care for all can be offered, before the drug epidemic in the city can be fixed, or the pill epidemic in the suburbs can be eradicated, truly offered through us, we must see a hurting world not through our judgmental pity, but through the broken-hearted compassion of God. Teresa of Avila once said, Christ has no body now, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the feet with which God Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which God blesses all the world. But more important, and most important, yours are the eyes through which Christ looks with compassion on this world. You. God, before we make a move to help and heal, help us readjust our eyes of compassion. Help us move away from, I have done enough for him or her, to what would you have us do? What would you have us expand on making the world a better place? How would you have us be your hands and eyes to fix what is broken. As Max said in his communion meditation, what is wrong with our world began way before whoever was in office was elected. Help us reach back past our ongoing self-centeredness to realize that what is broken can only be fixed as we look at your broken heart being band together to work with the good. Your son's name.